first time I ever turned an electronic uh, jamming pod on was about 15 miles outside of uh, Hanoi when the first SA-2 started whipping by the canopy and I said, well, I don't know what this is going to do, but it's got to be better than nothing. During the Vietnam conflict, the United States Air Force lost one aircraft for every two that were shot down. As a result, the Air Force conducted a study known as the Red Baron Reports to determine why our aerial combat performance was so low compared to previous engagements. The study showed that pilots and air crews were inadequately trained to prepare them for combat. Actually, they got cycled through to go back up to rest cap one of our other pilots that was shot down earlier. But that was not the only discovery the study revealed. They also discovered that if the guys could survive the first 10 missions, their likelihood of surviving the rest of their tour was extremely good. When you first go into combat, you want to feel like you're as ready as you can be. And they came up with the concept of, let's build a training program. Let's give the guys simulated combat. Let's give them 10 missions. So when they have to go to real combat, they're 10 missions into the flow already. Red flag the most realistic combat training exercise ever developed. We had sand missiles fired at us. We had enemy aircraft shooting all the time, trying to intercept us, and fortunately, nobody got shot down. Red Flag was born. Well, the first one that uh, uh, we had was in, uh, started in November of 75. It was sort of a trial run. Most of the time when you go into a new unit, you know, there's a structure, there's commanders, there's people that are going, you know, going to their next assignment, people coming in. It was almost an unknown thing. When I got to the base and, and checked in with personnel, I said, I'm assigned to Red Flag, and everybody said, I don't know what that is. We had, uh, I think, two desks, one chair, one telephone, and one telephone number for the entire coordination for the exercise. That first year, when the first Marine unit came, they were, uh, they were pitching tents down on the flight line. We had about, uh, I think, close to 40 aircraft, almost exclusively F-4s. It was the first time where we uh, didn't just train against each other within a squadron. Put somebody up against an airplane like a MiG-21, like we saw in, in Southeast Asia, now you've got a whole new ball game because that airplane acts and has capabilities far in excess of what you have. They came up with the idea for the aggressors. And I can assure you that the aggressor forces, whether they're uh, F-105s, 106s, uh, the people on the ground simulating the ground threats, or the aggressor squadron are putting forth their very best effort. They were trying to, at last, address training deficiencies, training problems that we had been kind of ignoring for years. And here was a solution right in front of us, and I was excited. I was part of it. This was cool. Well, I know I'm a professional, and I know my pilot's a professional, because we go out here and we get the job done every day, you know. He jumps in there, I send him off, hey, he waves and everything. You know, it's more than just, hey, officer and enlisted men thing. You know, it's two people. You know, and I really feel good knowing that I'm a part of this right here. And I'm doing my part, and he's doing his, and we're getting the job done. So that was known as Red Flag 1. From F-4s and F-5s, to B-2s and F-22s, and from analog mission planning to digital mission planning, Red Flag has evolved with the times to provide realistic training. Well, there's been a change in, in, in scale, uh, concept, uh, all sorts of things have just expanded to try and be more inclusive. In the old days, it was pretty much uh, all, what did you remember? And guys would try to draw it out on the chalkboard. 
Now, because of the, the systems that the Nevada Test and Training Range employs, we're down to, you know, the feet of where an airplane was or where a person on the ground was or a vehicle on the ground was. There's no more, uh, well, I shot you, no, you shot me, blah, blah, blah. The direct feedback that you get in the debrief is much better than it uh, was when the exercise first started. Back then, it's, uh, we employed what was known within the flying community as the big sky principle. Lots of big sky out there, just don't run into each other. Red flag two, three, four, and five, we were losing airplanes almost every exercise. Now, you know, it's all computerized. Uh, airplanes carry pods that record. And so we could match up all that real-time data and play it back in a debrief so that everybody can see it at the same time. What you'll see over the course of time, though, is there'll be more constructive and virtual integration into Red Flag. Virtual capabilities use real people, but computer simulated equipment. And the environments created for the virtual battle space are referred to as the constructive environment. In fact, this year we expect for the first time ever to have virtual Patriots. We expect to have a virtual J-Stars. And that'll be the first time we'll have some uh, red flag players flying in simulators at the same time that we have live players on the range. But of course the live fly is still important as well because until you put airplanes together in a piece of airspace having to deal with the weather and to deal with the changes and to deal with the contingencies that go on, to include those that happen in the space and cyber side, uh, it's, uh, it's not the right level of training until we put all those pieces together. During a month-long deployment, over 1,000 individual sorties will be flown by participating units, tasking all support elements to the maximum. The players change, the aircraft uh, evolve. Well, now it's, it's not at all unusual to have over 100 airplanes on the range in, in one combat situation. Our young guys now are so much better trained. Since its inception, you do not have to look far to find examples of Red Flag's contribution to combat readiness. The skies over Baghdad have been illuminated. Shortly after the, uh, uh, the conflict in Iraq kicked off in the early 90s, we had folks that made comments after they'd gone in flown combat in Iraq and said, hey, Red Flag was a lot tougher than this. Air crews have repeatedly expressed the benefits of Red Flag training on their ability to fly combat missions. What they reported to us was that if it hadn't been for Red Flag and their experience here on an integration basis, they'd have been totally lost, not knowing what to do or how to integrate. But because of the training they got in here, just before they went over there, they said it was a piece of cake. Over the years, Red Flag has evolved to include our sister services and allied partners to ensure interoperability across various platforms. It's not just an integration of U.S. systems. We have allies we have to work with. You can look at World War II or even Korea for that matter. Red Flag concentrates on advanced combat training. So at home we learn how to do the basic blocking skills, the tackling skills, kind of scrimmaging before the big game. And Red Flag is that scrimmage before the big game that allows everybody to play at the same time. It's that partnership that makes us stronger and that all starts first here at Red Flag. Logging more than half a million flying hours and training more than 440,000 personnel, Red Flag has hosted 6,000 units representing 29 countries since 1975. From its humble beginnings 40 years ago, Red Flag has grown to become an extremely realistic combat training exercise that has dramatically increased the survivability and lethality of our Air Force.